that's okay. I'll tell them here that I'm sorry. I, so the recording's going now. So this is uh, week 12 of Old Testament Prophets 2 on Wednesday night here at New Beginnings as well as online. And we just had, uh, for those of you joining later by YouTube, I'm sorry, I did not start the recording before Onesimo prayed for us. So I had a um, encouraging prayer by Onesimo and I'm sorry I caused you to miss it. Um, but uh, let's go ahead because tonight we have to finish the last half of Amos, Obadiah, which is just one chapter, and then the book of Jonah. So that's our, that's our, um, what's on the menu tonight for our study. And I want uh, to continue to use the, the videos because they help give us a good synopsis of each. Again, <clears throat> uh, Cheryl and Suzanne, I'm going to depend on you. If audio gets weak at any time or is messed up, please don't hesitate to speak up and let us know. Okay. So let, let's go ahead with, uh, I've gone to close, I've backed up a little bit to what we covered last time in Amos, uh, writing primarily uh, to the the Northern Kingdom. And one thing that I could show you here is remember uh, how he pointed out that he starts by addressing the nations. He says that it's going to be to Israel, but then he starts addressing the nations, the surrounding nations, uh, Damascus, uh, Ammon and Moab, the Edomites. So descendants of Lot, uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob's brother, uh, Esau, the Philistines, Judah, and then he zeroes in, uh, puts his crosshairs on Israel. And uh, he said it's like three times longer. You know, the message against Israel is longer than any of the other messages. And so it's just finishing up chapters, the reflection on one and two, but three through six go together and we're picking up in six. So I'm going ahead and starting the video here. Um, as you finish up chapter two. is done putting up with you. And so the opening of the next section explains why. God says, I chose you, Israel, from among all the families of the earth. This is an allusion to Genesis 12, how God had called the family of Abraham to become God's blessing to all of the nations. And so then God says, so this is why I will punish you for all of your sin. Israel had a great calling, which came with great responsibility, and so their sin and rebellion brings great consequences. Now, this section brings together a lot of Amos's poems, and you'll see a few key themes repeated over and over. So first, he's constantly exposing the religious hypocrisy of Israel's wealthy and their leaders, and he describes how they faithfully attend the religious gatherings, giving offerings and sacrifices, all the while neglecting the poor and ignoring injustice. And Amos says it's all a sham, that God actually hates their worship because it's totally disconnected from how they treat people. God says a real relationship with him will transform a person's relationships. And so Amos's call to true worship is to let justice flow like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Now these two words, they're super important for Amos and actually all of the prophets. So righteousness, or in Hebrew tzedakah, refers to a standard of right, equitable relationships between people no matter their social differences. And justice, or in Hebrew mishpat, refers to concrete actions that you take to correct injustice and create righteousness. And so both of these are to permeate the life of God's covenant people like a rushing stream fills a dry riverbed. The next theme is Amos's repeated accusations of Israel's idolatry. So remember, when the northern kingdom broke away from southern Judah, their king built two new temples to rival Solomon's in Jerusalem, and he placed a golden calf in each. Remember 1 Kings chapter 12. Since then, Israel had only accumulated more idols, worshiping the gods of sex and weather and war. And in the prophet's view, the worship of these gods 
always led to injustice because these gods don't require the same degree of justice and righteousness as the God of Israel, not to mention that these gods were immoral themselves. Not the God of Israel, he's different. So he can say in one place, seek me that you may live. And then right after that, say to Israel, seek good, not evil, that you may live. So true worship of the creator God of Israel, it's synonymous with doing good, with generosity, and with justice. And so the final theme in these chapters is that because Israel and its king have rejected Amos and the other prophets, God will send the day of the Lord. This is a great and terrible act of justice on Israel. And specifically, Amos predicts that a powerful nation will come and conquer and decimate their cities and take the people away into exile. And we know his prediction came true. Some 40 years later, the Assyrian Empire swooped in and did exactly as Amos had said. The book closes with a series of visions that Amos experienced and their symbolic depictions of the coming day of the Lord. So he sees Israel devastated by a locust swarm and then by a scorching fire and then they're being swallowed up like overripe fruit. And in the final vision, Amos sees God violently striking the pillars of Israel's great idol temple at Bethel and the whole building comes crumbling down. It's an image of God's justice on the leaders and the gods of Israel. Their end has finally come. But then, all of a sudden, in the final paragraph, we see a glimmer of hope. It picks up this image of Israel as a destroyed building, and God says that out of the ruins, he will one day restore the house of David. In other words, he's going to bring the future messianic king from David's line, and he will rebuild the family of God's people, which, surprisingly, we're told, is going to include people from all of the nations. All of the devastation caused by Israel's sin and God's judgment will that day be reversed. Now, this final paragraph is super important. It's the only sign of hope on the other side of judgment. And it helps us see how this book is exploring the relationship between God's justice and his mercy. If God is good, he has to confront and judge evil among Israel and the nations. But his long-term purposes are to restore his world and build a new covenant family. And so through Amos's words, we still today hear his call to learn from Israel's hypocrisy and disaster and to embrace a true worship of this God, which should always lead to justice and righteousness and loving our neighbor. And that's what the book of Amos is all about. So, let me see. Oh, it looks like, yes, Kirk, you've been able to join us. That's good. Uh, so that was the latter part of Amos. And uh, here we are in the book. And so open up your Bibles to Amos chapter 6. So that's where we start in Amos chapter 6. Now, you'll remember we finished uh, last week there at Amos 5, 24. We remember that. Uh, now, I guess even let me just back up just a couple of ver verses before. We, we noted that Amos 5, 21 through 24 was uh, almost verbatim to... I. Isaiah 1, 12 and following about 12 to 15 or so. So almost identical message. Uh, and we see there the Lord saying, I, I hate your feast and the outward things that uh, you are doing, those outer acts of worship, things that he had commanded. But he said they're abhorrent to me because your heart is empty, your heart not even just empty. Your heart is in the wrong place. You, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And so he says, I can't stand the noise of your assemblies. Uh, he says, what I want there in verse 24, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Justice and righteousness, mercy, uh, as, as Mackie noted in the video, and we've noted that uh, even Martin Luther King had borrowed that from 524 and was dealing with uh, trying to bring about racial justice in the US. 
Let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Then you go to chapter six and this message about complacency being kind of fat and sassy, uh, to be lazy spiritually. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion. Now, it's not hard for us to make the link, is it, to uh, Revelation 3, 16, where uh, Jesus speaks to the church in Laodicea. Uh, that's the only church in the seven in Revelation that nothing good is said about. Everything that he says to Laodicea is a rebuke. Three of them are a mixture of rebuke and praise. Uh, and then two of them are all good. But this, this reminds us of Laodicea, that they were lukewarm. And he said, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. So it's clear that the Lord, even from that in Revelation, but here complacency is something that he will not stomach, you know, thus all of the commands that we see in scripture. How are we to love God? Half-heartedly, with half of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? No, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this complacency, this split heart, uh, honoring with lips, but heart being far away, uh, and God will not uh, tolerate it. Um, Look at 6.8, um, the sovereign Lord has sworn by himself, the Lord Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob. First, the Almighty sworn by himself. There's no other name, no higher name for him to swear by. You know, we don't consider it swearing, but I don't know if you grew up with the saying like, by George, yeah, I'm gonna do that. We say by somebody like it lends some weight to what we're saying. Well, for the Lord, there's no name higher than his sworn by himself, I abhor the pride of Jacob. Uh, <clears throat> so both Israel here uh, and even Judah, but God abhorring pride. God, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that's from Proverbs 3.34. As I said, we know other parts of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. But you're going down to verse 34. The Lord opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. And of course, that's picked up in James 4, and uh, Jesus mentions it and talks about it in Matthew 23, 1 Peter 5. Um, God is drawn to humility like a magnet. And here, the pride of the religious leader. So that's one thing that we all need to guard against. And then sometimes as spiritual leaders, we can develop pride, pride that we've got it right, pride that we know better than others. And we, we have to guard against that. If we find the Lord opposed to us, he always opposes those who are proud in heart and look down on others. Uh, you go on to uh, seven, well, at the end of 6 and 14, he says, I'll stir up the nation against you, and that will be the Assyrians. So in 7, as he mentioned here, get to that, 7 to 9, uh, the visions, <clears throat> locust fire in a plumb line, locust swarm, scorching fire, overripe fruit. Uh, these, these are visions of the judgment that God is going to bring on the Northern Kingdom, on Israel, for their pride and their idolatry. Always, as we've said, idolatry is spiritual adultery. And we have to guard against idolatry ourselves here in America. Worshiping, fill in the blank. Affluence, entertainment, uh, our families, and to the Lord, since we are married to Christ, it is a form of spiritual adultery. Uh, now, after these visions, uh, you look in 710, uh, Amaziah, a priest at Bethel, and the Hebrew, bait, just to, you know, we can learn a little bit of Hebrew along the way. Bethel, if you break it down, a bait like uh, B-E-T-H or is his house and El is a is a contracted or short form of of uh, 
like Elohim, and so Beit El, house of God. Uh, Amaziah, of course, you remember Jacob there and setting up an altar and now it's become a place of idolatry. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. So he was one of the one of the idolatrous priests, a priest of Baal. He sends word to Jeroboam. This is Jeroboam the second. Remember, there's affluence under Jeroboam the second. And he says, Amos is raising a conspiracy against you. The land can't bear his words. He's saying in verse 11, Jeroboam the second will die by the sword and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, get out you seer, go back to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and do, and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and temple of the kingdom. So Amos's answer in 714 gives us some more insight about his biography. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son but I was a shepherd and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. And so, uh, you know, Amaziah is insulting you, you see her, uh, you know, um, another word for, you know, a prophet or one who has visions, go back to your own land. Uh, make your living there. And uh, he says, I was not a prophet. Shepherd tended to fig trees. The Lord called me and I'm giving the message. Uh, eight is the basket of ripe fruit. But look down at eight, four, and these are some of the sins. And this is often the case with either Israel, Judah, or other nations, mistreatment of the poor. Eight, four, hear this, you, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land. And saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we can may market wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. Uh, wheat, not just good pure wheat, but trashy wheat. Uh, the Lord is sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget what they have done. Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it more? Now stop there, don't read any further. Just go back and hear the message because it's so relevant to us today. Uh, he is saying uh, your treatment of the margin of marginalized people, of poor and needy, he says, I will not tolerate it. And God historically has brought judgment on people when they when they really abuse the needy and the poor and then cheat. Uh, they, they can't wait for Sabbath to be over. They're losing money. So get the Sabbath over with. And so they can earn more money, skimp the measure, boost the price, of course, false scales. They, they sell less, they cheat with their scales, add, add weight to the bottom of the, you know, the container and uh, boost the price up high. Um, sell the needy for a, poor, a pair of sandals. And it's not too hard to make the connection even to some of the big, uh, you know, the big companies, the corporations that do clothes. And for a while, Nike was one of those, you know, that was selling their shoes at the expense of the poor uh, in the sweatshops in India and other places. And uh, they, they got called on the carpet, what was it, over a decade ago that some of the or within a decade ago, some of the, there started being some uh, social accountability for where things were sourced overseas and how, what were the working conditions of some of those. So uh, Nike, you know, met some of the reforms and, and that's good. Of course they did it because they were forced to the bottom line, the, the dollar, uh, but those are the kind of things that the Lord takes no, note of. Doesn't matter if it's, they're quote, unchristian, or they're not Christian. Uh, he always sees that the land, he says, cannot bear up under this weight of mistreating the poor. Um, look at 811. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. 
Uh, I know you've probably heard that verse before, but for us today, we have such easy access to the Word of God, and yet we can be com very complacent about it. And when we talked about complacency while ago in Laodicea, we didn't go ahead and drive home the point with us. It's very possible for us to be uh, spiritual couch potatoes, to, to not be a fervent for the Lord and to just kind of kick back and go with the flow. And, and again, the Lord will not tolerate that. Here he says, for those who are not faithful in seeking the Lord, yeah, I will send a famine and a famine for hearing uh, words of life. And of course, in our own country, that's true. And if, if, if a believer, if a follower of Jesus feeds himself or herself on, you know, talk show, radio, TV, reality TV, uh, you know, American Idol, just that that's a pure diet of all of those things. There's a real starvation that's going on in the, in the heart uh, of someone like that. Jesus says in Luke 19, 26, that if we're not faithful with what we have, even what we have will be taken away. And we have such easy access to the word of God here in the U.S. Uh, I'm just reading today and Voice of the Martyrs, what, what a price they pay, just even down in South America and Colombia, how hard it is to get scriptures, in, especially in the guerrilla controlled, the FARC controlled areas of Colombia. And they, they risk their lives in North Korea as well, in Islamic countries. And here we have, we can have Bibles running at our ears. And if we're not careful and diligent in seeking the Lord, uh, we'll find ourselves uh, starving for real words, words of life. Uh, you go on to nine and he just continues to say that uh, I will punish uh, uh, Israel. And look at nine, seven. God cares about more than just the Israelites. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord, the Cushites, like in Ethiopia? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Cathor, and the Arameans from Kerr? Huh. So God has been at work in other peoples of the earth, even back at this time. We could have the impression that he's only for Israel and that he's against all the other nations, but you just can't read scripture, Old Testament, closely and uh and say that because god is at work in all of the nations and so he says uh the kushites are dear to me as well as the philistines yes even the philistines the arameans um, you go on uh the word of hope at the very end 911 interesting you know 911 in the us evokes uh, 2001, the Twin Towers, 9-11, here is a message of hope. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, build it as it used to be. Now, not the temple, literally. 13, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman, that their, their crops will be plentiful, new wine will drip from the mountains. Verse 14, I will bring back my exiled people, Israel, uh, 15, I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I've given them. Well, so don't look for a literal fulfillment of that. Sometimes people do today and, and uh, make all the eschatology depend on what's happening in Israel. But this is beyond just physical Israel. There was a partial fulfillment of 14 in verse 14 of bringing them back in 530 under Nehemiah and uh, Ezra, yes, and people, some of them came back. There's a partial fulfillment, but the ultimate is in Christ, of course. And the building the house of David is not the kingship of David like it was under David and Solomon. It's not the temple. It is the spiritual house of David, those who trust in the Lord. And so this is the message of hope. And it's interesting, this is 9-11. Uh, you go to Romans 9 through 11, chapters 9 through 11. And it is a message of hope for Israel. It's basically God saying through Paul, God is not finished with Israel yet. And so the it's interesting how the 9-11s factor in there. Well, that is Amos. 
And uh, so I'll pause if there's any uh, thoughts or reflections or questions about Amos. Uh, you know, if there's not, and they're after, if there's any thoughts, of course, we'll carry on. With, Kirk, oh, Kirk oh. I'd like to... I'd like to really, I just love the fulfillment of Amos 9 with Acts 15. And I've used that so frequently because the discussion is salvation by grace. And the interesting thing about it is that um, James actually refers to this Amos 9 passage. And, and what he says is so significant and because of who he is also, that's, that's another story too. But yeah. Amos 9 verifies salvation by grace through faith. And, and James says all the prophets, and he quotes this one to say all the prophets. And I thought, I still think that's just absolutely remarkable. Oh, that's good. Yeah, Kirk, thank you for bringing that out. Because as I turn to Acts 15, 15, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written after this i will return and rebuild david's fallen tent and that's amos 9 11. uh and so i appreciate you bringing that out sometimes i i see in reference where these scriptures are used in the new testament but i didn't that one and i need to uh, make a note of that x 15 15. And that, of course, is a whole discussion in Acts uh, about uh, not putting a burden on the Gentiles that even the Jews had not been able to carry and that Jerusalem council in Acts 15. And so building David's fallen tent, rebuilding it is more than just the people of Israel. It's all of these, the Cushites, the Philistines, the Arameans that he mentions before. So that's excellent. Yes, thank you for I okay. think that's a, one of the things that you said that, uh, that I believe uh, this is a verification of the fact that it can't be interpreted literally. It has to have a spiritual fulfillment, according yeah. to Amos 9. Uh, and it, 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 Amos 9 becomes, as I, I, I like to say, it's a key uh, to understanding all, nearly all Old Testament prophecy because that's what he says. That's what James says. It's This is all the prophets and then he quotes Amos 9 that's that's fantastic yeah yeah good point that uh to use that to help unlock the meaning and quote in a sense mystery of some of the old testament prophecies not mystery in a masonic lodge sense but mystery in the sense of the deep purposes of god that are not always immediately available or uh, you know, understandable to us. And so, yeah, when he summarizes the prophets and, and takes one from Amos that seemingly is talking about Jews only in a literal house of David and says, no, it applies to building this larger house of God, including Gentiles, then yeah, you're, you're right that that helps us to see even other passages that might seem to uh, suggest a literal fulfillment about Israel only uh, should be understood through, you know, through those lenses or glasses also. So very, very helpful. Thank you. That's why getting to have some discussion is so good because uh, I certainly don't uh, have all of the, the insights and it takes all of us together uh, to uh, you know, really come to a fuller understanding of God's word. Well, uh, so Amos, let me clear it. And, um, oh, I had to pull that up right quickly. Obadiah. The book of the prophet Obadiah. This is the shortest book in the whole Old Testament. It's a mere 21 verses. And at first glance, it does not look very promising. It's a series of divine judgment poems against the ancient people of Edom, which was a nation that neighbored Israel on the other side of the Dead Sea. However, there is way, way more going on here. So 
First, here's the backstory. The people of Edom were unique because they had a shared ancestry with the Israelites. They both belonged to the family of Abraham, who with Sarah had their son Isaac, who with his wife Rebekah had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now the book of Genesis told us the story of these two brothers, and to say the very least, they had a tense relationship. They each later received the names Israel and Edom, which eventually became the name of the families that descended from them. And these families replayed the same difficult relationship of their ancestors. Israel and Edom had enormous tensions throughout the centuries, but they still shared that family bond. And it's that bond that was betrayed and shattered in the tragic events of Jerusalem's fall to Babylon. So when Israel was invaded and conquered by Babylon, the people of Edom took advantage by plundering other Israelite cities and then capturing and even killing Israelite refugees. Now in other prophetic books, God held Israel's neighbors accountable for this kind of violence. And so here, Obadiah does the same for Edom. The short book has two halves. The first part is a series of accusations against the leaders of Edom, specifically for their pride and self-exaltation. Literally, as they lived up high in the desert rocks, but also metaphorically, they truly believed they were superior to the Israelites. And it's that pride that led the Edomites to not just stand idly by when Babylon came to destroy Jerusalem, but actually to participate in the destruction. And so God says through Obadiah that Edom will be brought down from their height and destroyed. As they have done to Israel, so it will be done to them. Now right when you think you're going to hear more about how Edom will meet its doom, the topic suddenly shifts in verse 15. We hear this, the day of the Lord is near against all nations. Now why do we all of a sudden shift from Edom now to all nations? This first is a hinge piece and it links the first half of the book to the second half where Obadiah announces the day of the Lord but not only for Edom, he widens his focus to include all nations. And Obadiah says that all prideful nations that act like Edom will face God's justice in the same way. They'll fall from their prideful heights and come to ruin. Now the combination of these two sections, one about Edom, the other about all nations, shows us why Obadiah was so interested in this tiny southern neighbor of Israel. Obadiah sees Edom's pride and fall as an example, an image of how God will one day confront the pride of all nations and bring about their fall too. It's hardly coincidental that in Hebrew, the word Edom or Edom is spelled with the exact same letters as the word humanity or in Hebrew, Adam. In Obadiah, Edom's rise and fall is a parable of how God's justice will one day oppose pride and violence among all nations in the day of the Lord. But as in all the prophets, God's judgment is never his final word. Specifically, remember the conclusion of the two books that came right before Obadiah, Joel and Amos. Joel had painted a picture of what will happen after the day of the Lord against all nations. He said that God would perform a new act of salvation in Jerusalem and that all who humbled themselves and called upon him would be delivered. And in the conclusion of Amos, he said that after the day of the Lord has judged Israel's evil, God would raise up the house of David and build a new kingdom for Israel that would include Edom and all the nations called by my name. And so the book of Obadiah has been placed right after Joel and then Amos to expand on these very promises about the hope of God's kingdom over all of the nations. And so the book concludes with a very hopeful future. God says he's going to restore his kingdom over the new Jerusalem, that he'll repopulate it with a faithful remnant. And then from there, God's kingdom will expand to include all the territory and nations around Israel. And so this little book contributes to the larger portrait of God's justice and faithfulness that we're seeing in the prophets. The ancient pride and betrayal of the people of Edom becomes an example of the greater human condition, all of the ways that we betray and hurt each other and God's good world. But there's hope, Obadiah says. Edom's downfall points to the day when God will deal with evil in our world, but also bring his healing kingdom of peace over all the nations. And that's what the book of Obadiah is all about. All right. <clears throat> so, as always, I find it helpful to have that breakdown when you go back to the history, of course, 
and you have the descendants of Jacob, also, you know, later known, called Israel, and then the Israelites, uh, Esau, Edom, and the Edomites, and the hostility that existed between them uh, through the centuries even. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when the Babylonians overthrew Jerusalem. So now we've moved in time uh, from Joel and Amos dealing with the northern kingdom. Remember, they, <clears throat> the northern kingdom was uh, defeated by the Assyrians in 721 BC, and the Babylonians took Jerusalem in 586. So there's, there's a difference of about 140 years there, Jerusalem, about 140 or so years after uh, the northern kingdom. And so this is quite a bit later. Here's Obadiah uh, talking about this after the fall of Jerusalem in 586. So we've uh, moved on about 140 years in time. And we'll go back again in a little bit <clears throat> with Jonah. Uh, Obadiah means servant of the Lord. And then so we're just looking at a few of the verses uh, here. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time because we'll need our remaining time in the book of Jonah, uh, but with Edom. So uh, noted here how they built their dwellings in the rocks, you know, in the cliffs. So that would be in modern day Jordan, Petra. If you just Googled Petra, you know, it's in modern day Jordan. And that's where the Edomites <clears throat> live. And so, yes, it was a you, might, you would almost say impregnable because they, it was just so difficult uh, to reach them in these rock faces, in these cliffs. And in their pride, they were felt superior. And then they were not only uh, proud, but ruthless in killing some of the Israelite refugees. And so here they are exalted on the heights and God says, you will come down. Uh, Proverbs, right? Pride goes before a fall. He says there in uh, the, verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks. You make your home on the height. You say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? So just it's, it's just repeated like clockwork, isn't it? And that nations tend, if they may have a decent beginning, but all nations, human institutions, tend to become filled with pride and arrogance. You know, and ours is no exclusion. Our, our country, that it's just the, the nature of nations to, to begin to be filled with uh, pride. Some of them, you know, some, uh, there's always those who are in positions of power and leadership. Uh, <clears throat> look at verse 10. So not only their pride, mm -hmm. verse 10, your violence, the violence against your brother Jacob or Judah, you will be destroyed. 11, on the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth. Uh, so not only watched the Babylonians and cheered them on, uh, you were like one of them. Uh, you know, you shouldn't, verse 13, you shouldn't march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster. Uh, look on their calamity. But then even worse, 14, you should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives or hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. So they were doing all that they could. They cheered and jeered. They killed. And uh, then 15, verse 15, so now it expands, not just to Edom. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. And your deeds will return upon your own head. So what about what scriptures, of course, principles can we see in the New Testament that are the same? As you have done, it will be done to you. Jesus in Luke 6, 37 and 38, don't judge or you will be judged. The measure that you use with others is the measure that's going to be used with you. For Paul in Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that you're going to reap. So it's that principle that's, that's always true. Uh, they fell in the pit they dug for Judah. But then there's always that uh, message of hope, 17. But on Mount Zion, 
will be deliverance. It will be holy. Uh, the house of Jacob will be a fire. The house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau will be stubble. They will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. So this little book <clears throat> has a message that reverberates down to the time of Jesus because Herod was an Edomite, King Herod, Herod the Great, under whom Jesus was, was born. And uh, he's the one that wanted to know from uh, the Magi, where is this king of the Jews? And uh, because he knew of this prophecy, uh, the house of Esau will be stubble. They will set it on fire and consume it. So, and, and he was a very paranoid king. And he had, he had one of his wives, really the wife that he loved the most, had her killed, strangled, because he thought she was conspiring. Some of his sons, extremely paranoid. And so when he hears about a king of the Jews, he wants to know who it is so that he can do away with the threat, try to ensure that the house of Esau is not snuffed out. So you see that in Matthew 2, 3 and following. And then you finish up in 21, deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Uh, so in the Messianic age, no, there is no uh, putting the descendants, you know, whether it's of the Edomites or any other group of people under the heel of the boot of Christians. It all belongs to the Lord. The kingdom belongs to the Lord. And uh, when saying deliverers will go up on Mount Zion, of course, the Jews could think that Jesus was going to be a warring king like David. But Jesus said, no. Peter pulls out his sword in the garden. He says, put it away. If you live by the sword, you'll die by it. If my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, my followers would fight. He forbids the use of the sword. Uh, rather, he succumbs to it, uh, to violence uh, himself. But as followers of Jesus, uh, we overcome by laying down our lives like Jesus did, like the slain lamb in Revelation. And that is how we bring about deliverance for people around the world today. And of course that's happening in all of the restricted access countries where, uh, uh, you know, Christianity or Jesus particularly in scripture is forbidden, whether it's North Korea or Islamic countries, but there you have people dying for the sake of Jesus and it continues to inspire and result in the deliverance of others. Well, uh, that leaves us about 20 minutes to be able to work through Jonah. And uh, I want to use the video on it because it's good. Uh, it gives a good overview of Jonah and how the book uh, is structured. And of course, you've, you've each probably already heard treatments of, of Jonah. There's you know, several different themes or highlights that you can give to each chapter. Uh, but I want us to go ahead. At first, I'm sorry, is there, is there anything in Obadiah that uh, anyone wants to reflect on? It was interesting how he brought out. Uh, Eric, yes. Just tell all the students that uh, National Geographic has a, syst has a series of books and, and they, they have a history. It's not the monthly geographic, but it's just called National Geographic History. And the issue on Petra, I have it here in my hand, uh, 20, uh, 2016, January, February 2016, is absolutely breathtaking with the shots that they made. And there is no wonder that Petra was so proud or that Edom was so proud. Mm -hmm. uh, the, engineering, um, the engineering that went into providing water for that city is absolutely astounding everybody ought to look at this if you do anything with the book of obadiah <laughs> thank you so uh what uh what what geographic publication it's, it's called national geographic history history yeah that's the whole series and then this this issue was devoted to petra 
And, and it's uh, January, February, 2016. 16. Probably can go to their website and find. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That. Oh yeah. Yeah. But the engineering is, oh, I, I was, I was astounded. I was astounded. It's amazing. Yeah. We, we, we tend to think of 2000 years ago, of course, of such maybe primitive technology, but it's, it's, uh, of course, if we've done any very in-depth study of history, it's uh, just the opposite. They can't today, they still cannot replicate some of uh, the technology that was used in uh, previous millennia to to do some of the things that they have done, like even Easter Island and the you know the the monoliths that are there. Uh, so that's uh, you're right to you know just marvel at the engineering feat. Uh, and I haven't even seen that particular aspect. So yes, I I would love to uh, to bone up on that as well. All right. Uh, Go into our final one for tonight, then, uh, Jonah. The Book of Jonah, a subversive story about a rebellious prophet who hates God for loving his enemies. Jonah's unique among the prophets of the Old Testament because they're typically collections of God's words spoken through the prophet. But this book doesn't actually focus on the words of the prophet. Rather, it's a story about a prophet a really mean and nasty prophet. Jonah appears only one other time in the Old Testament. It's during the reign of Jeroboam II, one of Israel's worst kings. And Jonah prophesied in his favor, promising that he would win a battle and regain all this territory on Israel's northern border. Now, it's important to know that the prophet Amos also confronted Jeroboam, and through him, God specifically reversed Jonah's prophecy, promising that Jeroboam would lose all of those same territories because he was so horrible. So before the story of Jonah even begins, we are suspicious of Jonah's character. The book of Jonah has a beautiful design with all this literary pairing and symmetry. So you have chapters 1 and 3 telling the story of Jonah's encounter with non-Israelites, first with some sailors and then with Jonah's hated enemies, the Ninevites. And each part offers a comic contrast between Jonah's selfishness and the pagans' humility and repentance. Chapters 2 and 4 contain prayers of Jonah. One is a prayer of repentance, kind of, and the other is a prayer in which Jonah chews out God for being too nice. Now, this careful design of the book is matched by a really unique style of narration. The story is full of all of these stereotyped characters who, ironically, do the exact opposite of what you think they would do. So you have the prophet, the man of God, who rebels and hates his own God. You have the sailors who are supposed to be really immoral, but actually they have soft, repentant hearts and turn to God in humility. You have the king of the most powerful, murderous empire on the planet, and he humbles himself before God because of Jonah. Jonah's five-word sermon, and even the king's cows repent. This kind of story fits what today we would call satire. These are stories about well-known figures who are placed in extreme circumstances, and they use humor and irony to critique their stupidity and character flaws. Let's just dive in and we'll see how all the pieces work together. The story opens as God addresses Jonah and commissions him to go preach against the evil and injustice in Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, Israel's bitter enemy. But instead of going east to Nineveh, Jonah goes in the opposite direction, finding a ship going as far west as you can go to Tarshish. Now the big question here is why? Why does Jonah run? Is he afraid? Does he just not like Ninevites? And we're not told yet. So the man of God tries to run from God, and he boards a ship full of pagan sailors. He goes down into the ship, and then he falls asleep. So God sends a huge storm to wake up his prophet, while ironically the sailors above board are wide awake to everything that's happening. They can discern that there's a divine power at work here. So they throw the dice, and they discover that Jonah, he is the culprit. So they ask Jonah to explain himself, and Jonah spouts off a whole bunch of religious mumbo-jumbo. He says, yeah, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God who made the sea and the dry land. What a joke, right? God made the sea and the dry land all right, and Jonah's dumb enough to run from this God by getting on a boat? And when the sailors ask Jonah what 
they should do, he says, kill me, right, by throwing me overboard, which kind of seems noble at first until you realize this could actually be his most selfish move yet. I mean, what better way to avoid going to Nineveh? So he puts his blood on these innocent sailors' hands by trying to force them to kill him. They're reluctant, of course, and they repent to God even as they toss him over. The storm subsides, and they end up fearing the God of Israel, and unlike Jonah, they actually worship God. But God foils Jonah's plans to escape Nineveh. As Jonah's sinking, God provides this strange, watery tomb for him, the stomach of a large fish. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, this would be certain death. But in this story, everything's upside down. And so Jonah's submarine death becomes his passage back to life. Cramped in the stomach of this beast, Jonah utters a prayer, where he never technically says that he's sorry, but he does thank God for not abandoning him, and he promises that he will obey God from this point on, no matter what. And God's response is quite comic. The whale vomits Jonah back onto dry land. So once again, God commissions Jonah to go and preach in Nineveh, and Jonah complies. We're told that Nineveh was a gigantic city. It would take days to walk through. So Jonah gets one day in, and here is his message. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. It's five words in Hebrew. Now, his sermon is very short, and it's also odd. I mean, look at what's missing. There's no mention of what the Ninevites have done wrong, or of what they should do to respond. There's no mention of who might overturn them. And most noticeable, there's no mention of God. What's going on here? Has Jonah intentionally given the bare minimum of information? It's like he's trying to sabotage his own message or ensure the Ninevites' destruction. There's just no effort on Jonah's part here. Whatever his motives are, the plan doesn't work. Because no sooner does he utter this five-word sermon that the king of Nineveh, the entire city, including all its cows, repent in sorrow and ashes. So for the second time, these evil pagans show themselves to be more responsive than God's own prophet. So God forgives the Ninevites, and he doesn't bring destruction on the city. Now, here's the brilliant part of the story. The last word of Jonah's short sermon, overturned, means just that, turned over. And it can refer to a city being overthrown or destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah, but it can also be used of something being transformed, like turned over and changed into its opposite. And so, comically, Jonah's words actually came true, but not in the way that he intended. Nineveh does get turned over as Jonah's enemies repent and find God's mercy. The final chapter brings all the pieces together. Jonah, he's fuming mad, and he utters his second prayer. He first tells God why he ran away back in chapter 1. It was not because he was afraid. Rather, it was because he knew that God was so merciful. And this is great. Jonah actually quotes God's own description of himself from the book of Exodus, and he throws it back in God's face as an insult. He says he knew that God is compassionate and that you would find some way to forgive these horrible Ninevites. You can just hear the disgust in Jonah's voice. Jonah then cuts off the conversation and he prays that God would kill him on the spot. He'd rather die than live with the God who forgives his enemies. Fortunate for Jonah, God doesn't comply and simply asks if Jonah's anger is even justified. Jonah ignores the question and he goes outside the city to camp on a nearby hill, waiting to see what might happen. You know, the Ninevites might repent of their repentance and get roasted after all. What happens next is very odd. God provides this viney plant to shade Jonah from the sun, and that makes him quite happy. But then God sends a tiny worm to eat up the plant, and so Jonah loses his shade. And there, in the heat of the sun, Jonah asks again that God kill him. So God, again, asks Jonah if his anger is justified, and Jonah barks back, absolutely just let me die. And those are Jonah's last words in the story. God's final words are what concludes the book. He says that this whole vine incident was an attempt to get through to Jonah, right? Jonah got all concerned and emotional over this vine, which he only enjoyed for a day. And God asked Jonah, you know, aren't humans a bit more valuable than vines? I mean, isn't it okay if God might feel the same kind of emotion and concern for the city of Nineveh that's full of thousands of people who have lost their way and also their cows? And that's how the book ends, with God asking Jonah for permission to show mercy to his enemies. And what is Jonah's answer? The story doesn't say, because that's not the point. The point is that the book is trying to mess with you. And God's questions here are actually addressed to you 
the reader, are you okay with the fact that God loves your enemy? And so this book holds a mirror up to the one who reads it. In Jonah, we see the worst parts of our own character magnified, which should generate humility and gratitude that God would love his enemies and put up with the Jonah in all of us. And so this strange story actually becomes a message of good news about the wideness of God's mercy that ought to challenge us to the core. And that's the book of Jonah. Right. As I mentioned, it's not uh, it's not the only way that we can uh, understand the book of Jonah. There, it, you know, through the years, I've taken notes from other teachers, and there's some other themes or perspectives. But regardless, these these elements are still there. Uh, have consistently heard through the years of, of course, kind of the bad attitude that Jonah has and that he never gets over it. And so it is insightful uh, when he started off here to talk about Jonah prophesying to Jeroboam the second, the same one that uh, we were referencing uh, back in, in Amos uh, in 2 Kings 14. And uh, the reason that we're sure that it's the same one is because they're both uh, called there in verse one in Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And same Jonah mentioned uh, in 2 Kings 14, 23 uh, through 25. And so Jeroboam's asking, you know, about the step it's going to to battle and Jonah says oh go God's favor is with you but here comes Amos from Judah uh, southern kingdom you know the sheep herder and the fig tender and says no uh, God's justice is against you his favor is not with you and so Amos speaks the word of truth so it does cast uh, Jonah in uh, question, even even from the beginning, and we can't answer the question. Well, why would the Lord choose Jonah? Uh, God is, uh, as Jonah throws back at him, as we noted over here, uh, gracious and compassionate, and so uh, he uses uses Jonah. Um, but that does tell us that Jonah was pretty nationalistic, that he was committed to Israel, even so much so to, uh, to just pander to an evil king, Jeroboam. And he did not care anything, of course, about uh, the Ninevites, hated them. And um, so God sending him, and he runs the he goes the opposite direction because he wants nothing to do with uh, helping the Ninevites, the Assyrians, uh, to come to repentance. And uh, so the ship, the Tarshish, as far as we know, maybe like modern day Spain, was running as far west as as he could. Um, so running away from God and. Uh, course, as he noted, well noted here, the pagan sailors are more righteous than Jonah is in uh, recognizing the storm is from God. Verse uh, 14, there in the middle, uh, towards the end of the verse, don't hold us accountable, O Lord, for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you please. And uh, so he's really not as innocent as as it might seem to them, thrown overboard. And then 17, God provides a great fish. We don't have to get hung up on whether it's a whale or, or not. Uh, a whale certainly is a great fish. The, the point of it is it's an act of God uh, because, you know, the point isn't to try to say, well, 
uh, yes, there's been a story of someone who, a sailor back in the whale hunting days that was swallowed by a whale and they did find him alive uh, later. It's, it's not so much to say, oh, it could happen. This is, this is an act of God. Uh, of course, the Lord can do it. And um, the point is, and that's one of the good perspectives that another teacher helped me to have on the book. The book isn't about Noah, Jonah. It's not about the Ninevites. It's really about God and his mercy. And we need to hear that. It's about the mercy of God uh, towards Jonah, a, a, a rebel prophet, a, you know, a, a not a very pleasant guy. So it's, it's God's mercy to him, but it's also God's mercy to quote Israel's enemies. And so today, you know, God doesn't change. He's still merciful to all people. Second Peter 3, 9, telling us he doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, Paul, Romans 2, 4, don't you know that uh, God's patience leads to repentance, that he's, he, he's not quick to send his son because there's so many without Christ that go into a Christless eternity. So it's about a great and merciful God and I had heard from other teachers about his prayer here uh, in chapter two. Uh, you know, not, not necessarily sign of a penitent heart. He never, never repents for his attitude or running away. He says, yeah, thank you for, for saving me. It's similar to some of the messages in the Psalms. So he just may have been quoting some of it. Uh, um, verse nine, in the latter part of nine, what I have vowed, I will make good. Uh, well, uh, that's not necessarily a, a heart turned back towards God, a vow to go to the temple and offer some sacrifice there, a thank offering. But of course, under Jeroboam, wasn't so much the temple worship wasn't about Yahweh, it was about Baal and others. Uh, and he had already shown, you know, that he wasn't uh, one of the true or trusted prophets. But he goes on to Nineveh in chapter three. And interesting, as we get insight from those who know more about Hebrew, uh, you know, five words in the Hebrew, uh, doesn't say anything about what their sin is or what they should do to respond. It's just saying, uh, all right, the only good news is in 40 days, you're going to be overthrown. And then of course, even a play on the Hebrew word there, overthrown, because it can be, you know, uh, turned over and even transformed, led to repentance. And that's what they did. Uh, Look at 310, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion, he didn't bring up on them the destruction he planned. Now, another important point that somebody brought out is that all of this action, and it's not really being cynical, but you could say for shallow repentance, there's nothing about, it. they may have, but it doesn't say they came to worship Yahweh the true God, they repented from their sins. And God has mercy on them. He has compassion on them. Uh, not even necessarily starting to worship him. Uh, so there is, it's, it's, so it's not about Jonah. You would need a fifth chapter because it just ends with him pouting and saying, I want to die. It's not about the Ninevites because, you know, their moment is here in chapter three but it's about God and his compassion, his mercy. So a big but in chapter four, Jonah was greatly displeased and angry. And he says uh, there in, in verse two, oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to run to Tarshish. I know that you are gracious and compassionate. God's slow to anger and abounding in love. God who relents. And so he quotes, like, as you noted here, uh, from 
uh, like Exodus, but it's also, you know, 34. It's in uh, uh, Exodus 20 and the, the, the Ten Commandments. And uh, he's bitter about God's mercy and compassion. And that's why I ran away. I know what kind of a God you are. And the, oh, wow, it's really kind of interesting. And, it, and uh, with Jeroboam, of course, not worshiping Yahweh, it's like, well, was his allegiance more even with uh, the Baals? But here, again, about God, his great mercy, and how he will use anyone to help others come to, to repentance. Um, it's interesting, verse 7, at dawn the next day, God provided a worm like he is doing Jonah a favor. He didn't curse the vine with the worm. He provided a worm. Well, it really is a favor in trying to help Jonah have an attitude adjustment. And in verse 8, God provided a scorching east wind. Uh, you could say, well, uh, that's what the gift's going to be. I uh, really rather not have it. But uh, he said, Jonah says there at the end of eight, I would rather die. And God says, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. And then the Lord's closing statements. You've been concerned about the vine. It sprang up overnight. Eleven, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? So some would say as far as the number in the city, 120,000 can't tell the right hand from the left, like probably, you know, even infants. So the city could have had certainly half a million or more and many cattle as well. Interesting that the Lord takes note of in his compassion. Yes, he cares about all creatures, great and small. Shouldn't I be concerned about that great city? So those are some uh, reflections on Zona. Um, of course, it's not a comprehensive treatment of, of every a component of the story, but gives us a good, uh, a good feel uh, outline uh, of the book. And uh, so as we come down to the end of our time, I'll pause, uh, see if there's uh, uh, any thoughts or reflections here on Jonah. God yeah. Seemed to, God seemed to be patient with Jonah, sort of willing to put up with his nonsense, <laughs> yeah. his attitude. Yeah. No, it's very true. Uh, it's a weird book. I just hadn't realized how strange it was. <laughs> It is, uh, and so patient with him. It's probably a good picture for us to keep in mind. I don't know about you, but it's it's not too difficult for us to have a perspective of God that he's, you know, arms crossed, standing back saying, okay, when are you going to get your act together, exasperated with us, but quite a different picture with, a, you know, a, a hard-headed, uh, bitter prophet Jonah, and he's very patient, you're right. Very... I don't think we would aspire to be like Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not really the one that we should uh, set up. I mean, we do a little better looking at Amos or Daniel or something. Yeah. Uh, no, that's good. Kirk? Yeah. Uh, one of the preachers, I, I used to have a series of books on the Minor Prophets, and he, he said that the re one of the reasons why Jonah got so angry was because and he wouldn't go back home. He sat out under the vine, you know, was because he wanted God to destroy the Ninevites, but he didn't want God, but he did want, and he also, he wanted them destroyed uh, because he felt like they were so mean, but he was so concerned about the fact that Israel wouldn't repent and God had promised, God had spoken to him and said, I'm going to destroy Israel in 722. And, it, and the guy said, it would be like a gospel preacher <laughs> going back to the home congregation and say, guess what? A whole city repent, but I'm mad about it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, with them being uh, enemies, 
to the Ninevites, you're right. We, uh, not exactly, might not get a reception that, uh, not a hero's welcome. Hey, I preached to the Ninevites and they repented. Um, yeah, good. What good. a turn, what a turn. <laughs> yeah, and so that's helpful to me. Just the whole book is about the, the great mercy of God, because great is a word used uh, several times in there, great city, and uh, just the, the great compassion and mercy of God. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you all for your input and your sharing, and we'll stop there. Love you, brother. Thank you so very, very much, man. Great class. Thanks. Good night, Kirk. Good night. We'll see y'all next week. Wasn't there another prophet? Wasn't there Jeremiah?